Hello, I'm the video professor. And you are about to learn software by means of a creative new concept in the computer industry. I'll take you step by step through learning your new software package. On the screen now are some other tapes available in my series. With them, you can watch and learn at your own speed. Stop and practice any time you want and review topics you don't understand. I suggest that you view each tape in its entirety. Then go back through the lesson with your computer and your software and practice each step. All of my tapes are designed to get you up and running quickly. Once you have viewed and practiced everything that is on these tapes, I think you'll find your software manual much easier to understand. And now, let's get started. Welcome to my introductory tape on the Apple II line of computers. After this short lesson, with a little practice, you'll know how to set up your Apple IIe, Apple IIc, or Apple II GS computer and have it running your software. Before we start, let me explain that I will be using an Apple II GS computer for this lesson. You may have an Apple IIe or an Apple IIc, but there are many similarities among these computers. Most of what I'll be explaining will apply to all three computers, and when there are differences, I will be sure to tell you. Most Apple II computers have at least one disk drive connected to them. If you have an Apple II GS computer, I will assume that one of these disk drives is a three and a half inch disk drive. A second disk drive is optional, but I will be demonstrating how to set up a five and a quarter inch disk drive as a second drive. Also, I will assume that you have a copy of either the Apple II GS system disk or the Apple II system disk, and that you have a blank disk ready to use when we practice formatting and copying disks. Regarding the system disk, I will be demonstrating version 3.0. Version 3.0 of the system disk requires you to have an Apple II GS with 512K of memory or an Apple IIe or Apple IIc with 128K of memory. If necessary, you can obtain additional memory and version 3.0 of the system disk from your dealer. Now let me introduce you to our students. They will be learning about the Apple computer along with you. And remember, if you need to review a topic, we never get tired of repeating ourselves. Let's begin this lesson by learning about some of the basic components that usually come with your Apple IIe, Apple IIc, or Apple II GS computer. The most important component is the Apple computer itself. It is here that most of the actual computing takes place, and because it is the most vital of all components, it is very often referred to as the Central Processing Unit, or CPU. Several peripheral devices can be plugged into your computer, but the most useful ones are the keyboard, the monitor, and the disk drives. Another peripheral device that may be attached to your computer is a printer. If you have an Apple II GS, you will also have a small peripheral device called a mouse. Together, these components comprise what is called a computer system and they perform most of the actual work that you will be doing with your computer. Professor, are there any other peripheral devices I can connect to my computer? Yes. You can also attach a modem so that you can use your Apple computer to communicate with other computers that may not be directly compatible with yours. In addition, there is a joystick and headphones that may optionally be added to your computer system. Although these devices are very useful, they are not usually considered essential components of a computer system, so we will not talk about them in this lesson. If you would like to learn more about them, refer to your manuals for more information. Professor, I understand that all these components make up a computer system. Well, how does this all work together? That's a good question. It's important to understand how your computer system works to get the most out of it. Basically, a computer system uses two types of peripheral components which are known as input and output devices. Input devices get information into your computer, and output devices are used to get information from your computer, usually in a form that is readable by you. One device for inputting information is the keyboard. Most computer keyboards consist of 80 or more keys that allow you to type in words and numbers. These words and numbers are accepted by the computer as information which may be translated into commands or which may appear in a letter you are composing. In addition, your Apple IIe, Apple IIc, or Apple II GS keyboard has special keys that give additional capabilities to some of the other keys. We'll learn more about these special keys later. The mouse that is attached to an Apple II GS keyboard is another type of input device. It is used by many programs as a type of pointer. With it, you can select programs from special pull-down menus and draw intricate pictures as well. 
The monitor is an output device. It is on this screen that the results of most of the commands you give your computer are displayed. If you are typing a letter, you will see it appear on the screen as you type it in. If you are using the mouse to create designs, you will see the designs you create display right before your very eye. Another output device is the printer. The printer is used to produce a paper copy of documents you write or designs you might create. Anything that you can type in can be conveniently transmitted to the printer later. A special device that can be used both as an input and as an output device is the disk drive. Imagine that a disk drive is like a filing cabinet with several file drawers. When a file drawer is open, the information which it contains can be copied and transmitted to the computer. Conversely, information that may be contained within the computer can be copied and transmitted back to the open file drawer. In reality, a disk drive is simply a sophisticated recording and playback device that transmits information to or from the computer. The open file drawer is the program or data disk contained within. The heart of your computer system is the Apple computer. Earlier, I called this the central processing unit or CPU. A quick look inside reveals why I use this name. All of the necessary elements used in controlling the input-output devices are contained here. Also, the memory and calculation components reside here. The green board that you see is called the main circuit board. This consists of thousands of interconnected electronic circuits that unite the memory, calculation, and peripheral controlling devices. These circuits are like a sophisticated traffic system with roadways leading to and from all the essential components on the board. The memory and calculation components are made up of integrated circuits. The little black modules that you see are called chips, and inside these chips are the integrated circuits that have been microscopically etched onto a single piece of silicon. Each of these chips perform a specialized task, but they are usually classified as being either RAM or ROM. RAM stands for Random Access Memory, meaning that this type of chip is used as a temporary memory device. RAM chips store the information that you provide, usually from an input device like a keyboard, mouse, or disk drive. As long as the computer is operating, it will store information that it must remember in RAM chips. ROM means read-only memory. ROM chips contain information and special commands that regulate communications between all of the interconnected components on the main circuit board and the peripheral devices like monitors, keyboards, and disk drives. Because these regulating commands are required each time the computer system is activated, ROM chips are permanent memory devices and cannot be used for temporary memory storage. One very important integrated circuit chip is called the microprocessor. In the Apple II GS, this microprocessor is named the 65C816, and it can directly communicate with 16,777,216 memory locations. This chip is the brain of the computer because it performs calculations at lightning speed and processes all of the information provided it by RAM and ROM chips and peripheral devices. To summarize all that I have said so far, your computer system is an array of input and output devices like the keyboard and mouse, monitor, printer, and disk drives. These peripheral devices are plugged into the computer where information is passed to or from them along circuits on the main circuit board. The microprocessor is like a traffic policeman. It processes information being passed to it, performs any necessary calculations, and then determines whether information should be temporarily stored in RAM or whether it should be passed back to the peripheral devices. All of this happens so quickly that you usually don't notice that any of it is taking place. Professor, you made this really easy to understand. But we're excited to use this computer. How do we set it up? The type of computer that you have determines how you will connect peripheral devices to it. If you have an Apple IIc or Apple II GS, peripherals like the keyboard, monitor, disk drives, and printers plug right into the back of the computer through external connections called ports. If you have an Apple IIe, all peripherals will need to be connected to the inside of the computer through plug-in devices called slots. The Apple II GS also gives you the option of using these internal slots. You will need to use these slots to connect older Apple products. 
and peripherals like printers that have been produced by other manufacturers to the Apple IIGS computer. Let's start by seeing how peripherals are connected into the external ports of an Apple IIc or Apple IIGS. Looking at the back of the computer, notice that there are several ports. Each port is labeled so that you know exactly what peripheral connects to it. For instance, the disk drive connects to the port that is labeled with a diskette icon, and the monitor port has a label that looks like a TV screen. On an Apple IIGS, the keyboard is external and must be attached to a port in the back. This is the only port that may seem confusing because its label indicates a daisy chain. That means that more than one peripheral can be connected or daisy chain to the computer through the keyboard. The mouse is one peripheral that is connected to the computer through the keyboard of an Apple IIGS. Okay, let's get started. Begin by finding the power switch on the back of the computer. Be sure that this switch is set to the off position. We don't want to risk damaging any peripheral while we are connecting it to the computer. Now find the power cord. Plug one end of the power cord to the computer and the other end into a grounded outlet. Now, if you have an Apple IIGS, connect the keyboard. The keyboard cable looks kind of like a spiral telephone cord. Plug one end of the keyboard cable into the keyboard port on the back of the computer and the other end of the cable into one of the ports at the top of the keyboard. Notice that there are two ports at the top of the keyboard. Doesn't matter which of these two ports you use to connect the keyboard cable because they are identical. The mouse also connects into the Apple IIGS keyboard. Plug the mouse cable into the port at the top of the keyboard that is not being used to connect the keyboard cable. Now it's time to connect the disk drives. There are two kinds of disk drives that can be connected to the disk drive port in the back of the Apple IIc and Apple IIGS. These are three and a half inch and five and a quarter inch disk drives. On an Apple IIGS, you may have up to four disk drives daisy chained into the disk drive port, but no more than two of each type may be connected in this manner. You may also daisy chain one of each disk drive type into this port. Begin by connecting the cable attached to the disk drive to the disk drive port on the back of the computer. If you have a second disk drive, its cable is daisy chained into the port on the back of the disk drive that is connected to the computer. After you have connected all of the disk drives, tighten the cables with the thumb screws attached to the connectors. The Apple IIGS will use one of these disk drives as a startup drive when the computer system is first powered up. Therefore, the order in which disk drives of dissimilar types are connected is important. As a rule, three and a half inch disk drives should be connected first in any chain. If you are confused about the order in which your disk drive should be attached, refer to your disk drive owner's manual for more information concerning this subject. Finally, Apple manufactured serial type printers like the Image Writer 2 are connected into a port on the back of the Apple IIc or Apple IIGS computer. Just plug one end of the printer cable into the printer port on the back of the computer. Plug the other end of the cable into the port on the back of the printer. Plug the power cord into the printer and the other end of the cord into a grounded outlet. Professor, how do we plug a peripheral device into a slot inside an Apple IIe or Apple IIgs computer? That's a good question. With Apple IIe computers, peripheral devices like disk drives and printers must be plugged into a slot inside of the computer. The internal slots of the Apple IIgs are optional but very useful for connecting certain peripherals that can only be connected through slots. For instance, most newer Apple printers are of a type known as serial printer. Because the printer port on the back of the Apple IIgs is a serial printer port, these printers can be plugged into that port. Some popular printers, however, are parallel printers and require an interface card that must be plugged into a slot. Interface cards provide the connector for the cable that must be attached to the peripheral. Now, let's see how a printer's interface card is attached to one of the internal slots. The procedure demonstrated here will be similar for internally connecting all peripherals. However, if you have an Apple IIe computer, you should refer to your manual for additional information about connecting disk drives. To plug an interface card into the Apple IIe or Apple IIgs computer, you must first remove the lid. 
Removing the lid of an Apple IIe is relatively simple, but removing the lid of an Apple IIGS is somewhat difficult. Wrap your hands around the rear corners of the Apple IIGS computer and hold the lid with your index fingers while pressing on the lid with your thumbs. When you feel the cover loosening, remove it from the case and put it in a safe place. Now, find the power supply. This looks like a long, narrow box inside of the case. Check to see that the power has been turned off to your computer and touch this box to discharge any static electricity from your body. Do this to avoid damaging internal components with static electricity. Next, find the slot that you will use to plug in your interface card. Apple recommends that you use certain slots depending on the device you are connecting when you plug in the interface card. These slots are numbered from 1 to 7 as you look inside of the computer and see the power supply case on the left side. Beginning with the leftmost slot, slot 1 is recommended for connecting printers. Slot 2 is recommended for connecting a modem. Slot 3 should not be used by any type of interface card on an Apple IIGS computer since using it might interfere with the Apple IIGS's built-in 80-column display. Slot 4 can be used to connect any type of interface card. Slot 5 should be used to connect 3.5-inch disk drives. Slot 6 should be used to connect 5.25-inch disk drives. And slot 7 can be used by any interface card. Notice that there are covered holes on the back of the computer. Remove the hole plug that is nearest to the slot that you intend to use. On an Apple IIe, these plugs simply pop out. On an Apple IIGS, turn the plug retainer in a counterclockwise direction. Begin attaching the printer by pulling the cable that connects to the interface card through the hole in the back of the computer. Attach the cable to the interface card according to the directions you will find in the manual that comes with the interface card. Now, plug the interface card into its slot. Avoid touching the gold connectors on the bottom of the interface card, but plug this edge into the slot. You will need to apply pressure to the card as you push it into the slot. But don't wiggle it from side to side. Instead, use your thumbs to gently rock the card end to end until it slides snugly into the slot. Finally, attach the other end of the interface card cable into your peripheral device. If the device has a power cord, plug it into a grounded outlet. Don't forget to replace the lid to your computer when you have installed all interface cards into their internal slots and connected all of the cables to their peripheral. The final step in setting up your Apple IIe, Apple IIc, or Apple IIgs computer is to connect the monitor. There are several types of monitors that you can connect, but they are basically of two types. Monochrome or composite color monitors that can be used by all three types of Apple II computers, and analog RGB color monitors that can be plugged directly into a port on the back of the Apple IIgs computer. Monochrome or composite color monitors have a cable that is identical on both ends. One end of this cable plugs into the port at the back of the monitor. The other end of the cable plugs into the identical looking port on the back of the computer. Plug the monitor's power cord to a grounded outlet. Analog RGB color monitors should have a cable that is called a DB15 connector. This cable can be identified because each end of it looks something like the letter D with 15 little pins. Connect one end of this cable into the monitor port on the back of the Apple IIgs computer. Connect the other end into the port on the back of the monitor. Tighten the thumb screws on each of the connectors and plug the monitor's power cord into a grounded outlet. Professor, now that the computer's all set up, are we ready to start using it? We're almost ready. In fact, you could start up your computer right now if you had a program to run, and you could probably use it successfully. However, the Apple IIgs has several built-in characteristics that you may want to or need to change depending on the peripheral devices you have attached to your computer. Also, you may want to customize the look or feel of your computer to suit your specific tastes. The Apple IIgs has a special program called the Control Panel, which is always available to you in case you would like to change something about your computer. 
For instance, with the control panel, you can change the colors of the text or text background, the volume of the built-in speaker, and the responsiveness of the keys on the keyboard. Once you have made these changes, they will always be used by the computer when it starts up. Of course, you can use the control panel anytime if you want to change something about your Apple IIGS. Let's practice using the control panel to set the battery-operated clock and calendar that is built into your Apple IIGS. This is something that you will only need to do once because the battery should last for between 5 to 10 years. To activate the control program, you will need to turn your computer on in a special way. So let's get started. To begin, find the power switch on your monitor and be sure that it is turned on. Now find the special key on your keyboard marked Options. You must be depressing this key when you turn on the power to your computer. Finally, find the power switch to your computer. It is located at the left rear of your computer as you are facing it. Okay, with the index finger of your right hand, hold down the Option key. While you are holding this key down, reach around the left side of your computer and turn on the power with your left hand. You should now see a numbered list displayed on your monitor. This list is the gateway to the control panel. Enter the control panel by pressing the number 1 on your keyboard. You now are looking at the control panel main menu. This is the main selection screen. And just like a menu in a restaurant, you use this screen to select characteristics about the Apple IIGS that you would like to change. For instance, notice the word display at the top of this menu. Display controls such characteristics as the color of text, the color of the background on which the text will be displayed, and whether text should be displayed in 40 or 80 columns. To make a selection from the main menu, you will need to use some special keys on the keyboard. Find the arrow keys on your keyboard. You will use the up and down arrows to highlight the other options listed on the main menu. Now find the return key. You will use this key to select the option you wish to change. OK, press the up arrow key. Notice that each time you press the up arrow key, it moves the highlight bar to a new option on the main menu. Keep pressing the up arrow key until you have moved the highlight bar on top of the clock option. Now just press the return key. You should now be looking at the clock display. This is the option you have chosen from the main menu. Notice that the time and date is displayed in a rectangular box near the upper right of this display. The time and date shown there is probably wrong so we will use the options on this display to make the appropriate changes. Now notice that month is highlighted. To change the number that is displayed here, use the right or left arrow keys. Try pressing the right arrow key now. Each time you press this key, you should see the number displayed next to month increase. Try pressing the left arrow key. Each time you press this key, the number should decrease. All right, use the left or right arrow keys to change the number so that it displays the appropriate month. Ours is 12. Let's change the day and year now. Press the down arrow key to highlight day. Press the right or left arrow keys to change the number until it is appropriate. Ours is 26. Once you have changed the day, press the down arrow key to highlight year. Again, press the right or left arrow keys to change the number until it is appropriate. Our year is correct, so we won't change it. Next, let's set the correct time. Press the down arrow key until hour is highlighted, and then use the left or right arrow keys to change the number to the appropriate hour. Ours is 3. Be sure that you are correctly setting the hour to either... the down arrow until minute is highlighted and press the left or right arrow keys to display the ours is 25. Finally, press the down arrow key until second is highlighted. If you want to change the second, use the right or left arrow keys to set the appropriate second. This, however, is optional. By the way, 
You may have noticed that two options called Format have check marks next to them. These check marks mean that the Apple IIGS has been preset to the characteristic displayed. For instance, the Format option for the date shows that the date will be displayed as a two-digit month, two-digit day, and a two-digit year. You can change that preset characteristic to another kind of date displayed by simply highlighting Format and then pressing the left or right arrow key. Since the preset characteristics displayed here are very common date and time displays, there is really no need to change them. Okay, you have changed the date and time. To save the changes you have made so that the date and time will always be correct when you start up the computer, just press the return key. Press the return key now. Notice that the rectangular box now correctly displays the date and time. You should once again be looking at the control panel main menu. If you wish to change any other characteristics about the Apple IIGS, you simply highlight the option and press return. Even though it is kind of fun to customize your computer, there is usually no need to make any changes because the characteristics that are most often used have already been preset for you. One option on this menu that you may need to change is slots. If you have a peripheral device attached to an interface card, which you have inserted inside of the Apple II GS, you will need to change one or more of the characteristics associated with the slots option. This is because the ports on the back of the Apple II GS correspond to the slots inside of the Apple II GS. For example, the printer port on the back of the computer corresponds to slot 1. That means that you can't use a printer that you have attached to an interface card in slot 1 until you have activated this slot in the control panel. Otherwise, the Apple II GS will assume that the printer port on the back of the computer is active. Making all of the changes that are possible using the control panel program is more than we have time to do in this lesson. If you need to make changes such as activating slots, refer to Appendix A of the Apple II GS Owner's Guide. That's enough of the control panel for now, so turn off your computer. Just reach around the left side of the Apple II GS and turn off the power switch that is on the back left panel on the rear of the computer. Let's review what we have learned so far. You now know something about a computer system and how it works. Remember that some peripheral devices like the keyboard are called input devices because they allow you to get information into the computer. Some peripherals, like monitors, are called output devices because they allow the computer to get information back to you. Inside the computer are circuits, ROM chips, RAM chips, and the microprocessor. It is here in the central processing unit that all information processing and calculations take place. You also know how to set up your computer. Remember, many peripheral devices can be attached directly to the back of Apple IIc and Apple IIgs computers through the appropriately labeled port. However, some peripheral devices must be attached to interface cards that are connected to your computer through the internal slots of the Apple IIe and Apple IIgs. With the Apple IIe, slots are the only way to attach peripherals like printers and disk drives to your computer. The control panel is a built-in program that allows you to customize your Apple IIgs by changing certain preset options found in the control panel main menu. You can access the control panel program by pressing the option key when you turn on your computer. Remember, once you have changed a setting in the control panel, you will never have to change it again until the battery that is built into your Apple II GS needs to be replaced. Professor, now are we ready to use a computer? Yes, you can run any application with your Apple computer simply by inserting the application disk into the startup disk drive and turning on the computer. What I mean by application is a program like a word processor, a database, an educational program, or a program that entertains like a game. Usually an application program comes on a single disk, and when you start up the computer with that disk in the startup drive, the application takes control of the computer. What you see on the monitor and what you can do with the computer depends on the application that you are using. To practice starting up and using your computer, you will need the Apple II GS system disk or the Apple II system disk that I talked about earlier. This disk contains several programs called utilities. 
Utilities help you to manage all the disks that you will probably begin to accumulate as you continue to use your computer. While we practice with this disk, we will learn about utilities that use the mouse on the Apple II GS and other utilities that use the keyboard on Apple II E and Apple II C computers. We will also learn how to prepare disks to save information we create while using an application and how to make identical copies of disks. Before you use your system disk, however, it is a good idea that you write protect it. Write protecting any application disk is a good idea because this prevents the disk from being accidentally erased or damaged. Unless your application's manual specifically directs you not to write protect it, you should always do so. If your system disk is one of the three and a half inch variety, you write protect it by moving a small plastic tab that is on the back side of the disk. Simply take a sharp pencil and slide this plastic tab toward the top of the disk. If after you move the plastic tab, you can look through a small window, you have properly write protected your three and a half inch disk. Write protecting five and a quarter inch disk involves placing a small piece of plastic tape over the square notch that has been cut into the disk side. You can usually find an ample supply of plastic tape pieces that are ready made for write protecting inside of any box of new five and a quarter inch disk. You may have noticed that there is no notch cut into the side of your Apple II system disk. If this is the case, that disk is already write protected for you. Okay, now that your system disk is properly write protected, insert it into your startup disk drive. With an Apple IIc, the startup drive is the one built into the side of the computer, and with the Apple IIe, the startup drive is the one with the cable connected directly to the computer. On the Apple II GS that I am using, the startup drive is the three and a half inch disk drive. Turn on the power to your monitor, and then reach around the left side of your computer and turn on the power switch that is on the back panel. After several seconds of disk activity, you will be rewarded with the appearance of an application on your monitor. If you are using an Apple II GS computer, the application that you see is called the System Disk Window. The System Disk Window is always the first thing that you will see when using the Apple II GS System Disk. And it displays a list of other applications that you can run from this disk. If you are using an Apple IIe or an Apple IIc, the System Disk has no System Disk Window. Your screen will look different, so please be patient while I discuss this window with Apple II GS owners. The System Disk window is a mouse-based application that lets you use a mouse if you have one attached to your keyboard. As I said earlier, the mouse is an import device that you can use like a pointer. Try using your mouse now by moving it across your desktop. You should see a small arrow called a pointer moving in a corresponding way across the monitor. Whenever you move the mouse on the desktop, the pointer will try to mirror that movement. With a little patience, you can use the mouse to move the arrow so that it is placed in any location on the screen that you desire. Now practice moving the pointer with your mouse to specific locations on the system disk window. Place the arrow on top of one of the names that has a picture of a file folder. Next, move the pointer until it rests on a picture of a hand holding a pencil. These pictures are called icons. And in some mouse-based applications, these icons represent subdirectories and other applications. I have just mentioned subdirectories for the first time, so let me take a few minutes to explain something about them. Some Apple disks can be organized into a system of directories. In this way, many applications and data files can be organized logically. Think of a disk as if it were organized like a tree. The trunk of the tree is called the directory. When you make a selection from the directory, you proceed to another directory called a subdirectory. The subdirectory is like a branch of the tree, and in a subdirectory may be related applications and data files. Each time you make a selection from a subdirectory, you are taken to another branch or subdirectory. Eventually, you will end up in a subdirectory that is the last branch of the tree. In the system disk window, the file folder icons indicate a subdirectory, and hand icons indicate applications. You are now going to choose a subdirectory that contains an application that will allow you to manage your disk. Move the pointer to the subdirectory called SysUtils. Now, rapidly press the button on the mouse twice. You have now opened the SysUtils window, which is a subdirectory of the System Disk window. Notice that the name of the SysUtils is at the top of the window. When you use the mouse, pressing the button twice while pointing at a subdirectory opens or activates that subdirectory. You should now see a list of the names that are in this subdirectory. 
One of the applications that is contained within this list of names is called SysUtil System. Move the mouse on top of the SysUtil System application. Remember, pressing the mouse button twice when the arrow is on a subdirectory or an application opens it. So open this application by pointing to it with the mouse and pressing the button twice. You have just opened the System Utilities application that is located in the System Utilities subdirectory. The screen that you now see is called the System Utilities Main Menu. If you're using the Apple IIe or Apple IIc, the System Utilities or your Apple II system disk is identical to the application you see here. At this point, you can follow along again because I will be discussing information that applies to all three types of Apple II computers. Remember, I said earlier, that a menu presents a list of options. The options that you see on the System Utilities main menu are utilities that allow you to work on entire disks, work on individual files, work on Pro-DOS disk only, and other options. Professor, what is Pro-DOS? That's a good question. Any program that you have cannot be run until you have first set up your computer with DOS, which stands for Disk Operating System. ProDOS is the latest and most versatile of these disk operating systems. A disk operating system is a program that sets up the computer's memory, or RAM, so that it can exchange information with a disk. In the Apple II line of computers, there are three varieties of disk operating systems. They are ProDOS, Pascal, and DOS 3.3. Each of these varieties is a little different, and data created with one of these disk operating system cannot be used directly by an application created with another disk operating system. Most of the recent applications that have been written for Apple computers, like AppleWorks, have been created while the computer was using the ProDOS disk operating system. Now, let's get back to the system's utilities. These utilities allow you to manage your disk under all three operating systems. If you are not sure what operating system you are using, the system's utilities will even help you find out. Let's practice using some of these system utilities to work with disks. Look at the options listed underneath the heading Work on Entire Disk. These are utilities that help you perform special tasks on disks that are pertinent no matter what operating system created them. The utility that is highlighted, Catalog a Disk, let you see all of the names of applications and data files that reside on that disk. Let's choose that utility by pressing the return key. Okay, you are now looking at a screen that specifically asks, where is your disk? You'll always be asked to select the location of the disk you will be working on after you have made a choice from the system utilities main menu. Since your computer system probably has more than one disk drive connected to it, the operating system wants to know which disk drive contains the disk that you want to work with. This screen gives you the opportunity to specify the disk drive. Let's catalog the system disk. You must highlight one of these options, slot and drive or ProDOS path name. Since you probably don't know what the ProDOS path name of your disk is, select the slot and drive option and press the return key. Having chosen the slot and drive option, you see the word slot and drive appear. The numbers indicate the location of one of the disk drives that is connected to your computer. You may have to change one or both of these numbers to specify the disk drive where your system disk is located. Before you change any of these numbers, determine the slot where your disk is located. If your disk is in the three and a half inch disk drive, it is located in slot five. If your disk is in a five and a quarter inch disk drive, it is located in slot six. Also, since you may have more than one disk drive connected to either slot 6 or slot 5, you must determine the drive number. The disk drive that is first in any chain is always drive 1. The disk drive that is daisy chained to drive 1, if it is of similar type, is drive 2. If the second drive is of a different type, it is probably drive 1. <laughs> what I've just said is complicated, so let me illustrate using the computer system we set up. The three and one half inch disk drive is connected directly to the computer, so it is located in slot five, drive one. The five and a quarter inch disk drive that is daisy chained here is located at slot six, drive one, since it is dissimilar to the first drive. If all this still seems a little confusing, 
Refer to your disk drive owner's manual for more information about slots and drives. Now that you have determined the location of the disk drive where your system disk is located, change the numbers if necessary to specify the location of your disk. This is a keyboard-based utility, so you cannot use the mouse. Instead, use the right or left arrow keys to move to the appropriate number. Then change the number by typing the number you desire. Ours is slot 5, drive 1. When you see that you have correctly specified the slot and drive numbers, press the return key. You are now looking at the catalog or listing of the names of files that are on the system disk. Professor, what exactly are files? A file is any information that has been stored on a disk. It could be data, an application, or a subdirectory. Think of a data disk as though it were a file drawer of a file cabinet. Contained within any file cabinet drawer may be a great number of file folders, each containing data. When you open a file cabinet drawer, you survey all the file folders, but you cannot see what's inside each folder. The only way you have of knowing what may be inside is by looking at the label placed on each folder. This label is usually displayed in a prominent place so that it can be seen when the drawer is open. Now, the catalog of the system disk is showing information about the files that are on that disk. Remember, you can't actually look inside to see the data that is contained within each file. The catalog does, however, show you more than just file names. You also see the operating system which created this disk, the path name of the disk if it was created with ProDOS, or the volume number of the disk in case it was created with DOS 3.3. Also, beside the file's name, you will see its type and how big it is. Additional information that you will see in a catalog is how much space has already been used by files and how much space for files remains on the disk. Well, we've seen enough of the catalog of the system disk. To leave the catalog and return to the system utilities main menu, press the escape key that is located near the upper left-hand corner of your keyboard. Press the escape key now. There. You're looking once again at the System Utilities main menu. Let's use one of the other utilities list under the Work on Entire Disk heading. The next utility we will choose is called Format a Disk. Formatting a disk is one of the most important things we can do to a new disk that has never been used before, because a blank disk has no way of accepting information until it has been formatted. Think of formatting a disk as being similar to painting lines on a newly paved parking lot. The cars have no way of knowing where to park until those lines are made. It's the same for data on a disk. Until it is formatted, it does not know where to park. Formatting a disk is a one-time only task. Once it has been formatted, you shouldn't format it again unless you want to erase all of the information that has been saved on the disk. Let's format the blank disk that I said you should have ready. Select the Format A Disk utility by using the down arrow key to move the highlight bar on top of that choice. Now press the return key. You should again be looking at the question, where is your disk? Notice that the option slot and drive is highlighted, so press the return key. Now change the slot and drive numbers to indicate the disk drive location where you want your blank disk to be formatted. Let's quickly review the rules for slot and drive numbers. Three and a half inch drives are usually in slot five. Five and a quarter inch drives are usually in slot six. The second drive is designated as drive 2 if it is the same type as the first drive. It is designated as drive 1 if it is of a different type than the first drive. Okay, change the numbers by moving to them with the left and right arrow keys and type the changes. We have only a single 3.5 inch disk drive, so the blank disk we will format will be in slot 5, drive 1. Now, press the return key. The message you see on the screen is prompting you to select an operating system. We're going to format this disk with ProDOS, because that is the operating system that is used by most of the recent applications like Apple Works. Use your up or down arrow key to highlight the ProDOS choice and press the return key. When you format a disk with ProDOS, you must give it a specific name which determines the name of that disk directory. That's why the screen you see now is asking you to type a name. The name that you see here is the suggested response in case you can't think of a name. You can accept this name by simply pressing the return key. However, if you decide that you would like to give your disk a certain name, 
There are a few rules you should follow. Names must begin with a letter, and they can only be made up of letters, numbers, and periods. There can be no more than 15 characters in a name. No name can have spaces or punctuation marks other than periods in it. Keep the name as short as possible and make the name descriptive of the files that you intend to be stored on that disk. Let's give the disk the name My Data. I have chosen this name because you can use the disk to store any data from applications that operate under ProDOS. To edit the suggested name, place the cursor, that's the flashing line you see, on the first letter of the name. If your cursor is not already on the first letter, use the left arrow key to move it there. Now, hold down the control key with a finger on your left hand, and press the X key with a finger of your right hand. The suggested name has disappeared. Finally, type the name you wish to call your disk. Type my period data and press the return key. Now you'll be instructed to place the disk you want to format, that's your blank disk, into the disk drive that you have designated. If you are using the same drive that already contains your system disk to format your blank disk, remove the system disk. Replace it with your blank disk and press the return key. Assuming all has gone well, you should see a message to inform you that your disk is being formatted. Formatting takes several seconds to complete, so pause the tape here until you see a message on your screen that formatting has been completed. Then restart the tape. You have just successfully formatted your blank disk. Press the escape key now to return to the system utilities main menu. There is one last utility underneath the heading of work on entire disk that we should explore. That utility is called duplicate a disk. Duplicating a disk means that you are going to make an exact copy of one disk onto another disk. It is always a good idea to make copies of all your disks so that you have backups in case one of your disks is damaged. We are going to select duplicate a disk to make a backup copy of your system disk onto the disk you just formatted. Use your up or down arrow to highlight the Duplicate a Disk utility and press the return key. The screen that you see here is prompting you to designate the slot and drive number of the disk drive where your source disk is located. The source disk is the original, the disk you want to duplicate. In this case, that's your system disk. To determine where your source disk is located, remember the rules for slot and drive numbers. A single three and a half inch disk drive is in slot five, drive one, and a single five and a quarter inch disk drive is in slot six, drive one. A second disk drive of any size is in drive two. If necessary, change the numbers to properly designate the slot and drive of the disk drives where your source disk is located. Our three and a half inch system disk is located in slot five, drive one. Once you are certain that both the slot and drive numbers correctly designate the location of your source disk, press the return key. Now you see a screen that asks for the location of the destination disk. The destination disk is the disk where you want the identical copy to be made. Use the disk that you recently formatted as your destination disk. Before determining the disk drive where your destination disk is to be located, you should know that there are restrictions governing how copies of disk can be made. For instance, you can make a copy of a three and a half inch disk onto another three and a half inch disk. You cannot, however, make a copy of a three and a half inch disk onto a five and a quarter inch disk or vice versa. This is because the three and a half inch disk holds more information than five and a quarter inch disk. Now, if your computer system has only one disk drive or if your disk drives are not the same size, you should designate the destination disk as being located in the same disk drive as your source disk. If you have two disk drives of the same size, you can specify that the destination disk is located in drive two. Since our computer has only a single three and a half inch disk drive, we won't need to change any numbers here. However, if the slot and drive number of your destination disk drive must be changed, type the change now. Once you are certain that both the slot and drive numbers correctly designate the location of your destination disk, press the return key. If you are using two disk drives to duplicate your disk, 
you will see a message box instructing you to place your source disk in drive 1 and to place your destination disk in drive 2. Since we are using only a single disk to make your copy, the message box that you see here instructs us to place the destination disk in drive 1. Follow the instructions that you see in your message box and be sure that your disks are in their destination disk drive. Now, press the return key. At this point, you will be instructed to enter the name of the new volume. This message means that just like when you format the disk, you must type a name for the destination disk. If you are using two drives to make your copy, accept the suggested name for the new volume by pressing the return key. If you are using a single drive to make your copy, you will probably want to change the name that is suggested. Since we have only a single disk drive to make our copies, and since we are going to make a copy of the system disk, the name that we should use is system disk. Change the name to system period disk and press the return key. At this point, you might see this message on your screen asking whether it is okay to destroy the name disk. If you see this message, that means that the destination disk has already been formatted. The disk name here, my disk, is the one we previously formatted, and it is the one we are using as the destination disk. Since we want to copy the system disk onto this disk, it is okay to destroy it. Highlight the yes choice here and press the return key. Finally, if you are using two disk drives to make your disk copy, things should proceed automatically until the copying is completed. The message you will see on the screen will inform you that your disk is first being formatted and then being duplicated. If you are using a single disk drive to duplicate your disk, you will be prompted when it is time to switch source and destination disks. The copying process usually takes quite a while, so pause the tape at this point. Restart the tape when the duplication of your disk is completed. Well, you've learned a great deal in this lesson. There are many other choices in the system utilities that you can explore, but that's all we have time for now. To learn more about the utilities on the system disk, please read your system disk user's guide. To leave the system utility, use the arrow keys to highlight the quit choice. If it is available to you, choosing quit is the best way to leave your application, because the application has a chance to remind you to save what you have been working on, and it keeps you from quitting when an application is in the middle of doing something. After you have properly quit an application, you can remove your disk from the disk drive, turn off your computer, and turn off your monitor. Let's close this lesson with a quick review of what you have learned. A computer system consists of peripheral devices that input to your computer or take output from your computer. The heart of your computer system is the central processing unit where all calculations and processes take place. You set up your Apple IIc and Apple IIgs by plugging peripheral devices into the ports on the back of the computer. Some peripheral devices, like parallel printers, require an interface card and must be plugged into one of the internal slots in Apple IIe and IIgs computers. Apple IIe computers require all peripherals to be plugged into slots. The control panel is a built-in program that lets you customize your Apple IIgs. It is not often needed, but you must use it to change slots if you plug an interface card into one of the internal slots. Starting your Apple computer with an application is as simple as placing a disk into your startup drive and turning on the power to your monitor and your computer. When quitting, use the quit option in an application if it is available. Otherwise, simply turn off your Apple IIgs computer and your monitor. Don't forget to remove your disk from your disk drive. An operating system is a special program that a computer uses to communicate with the disk drives that are connected to it. The Apple II computers use the three operating systems, ProDOS, Pascal, and DOS 3.3. Formatting a disk means that you are preparing it to be used by your computer's operating system. A disk only needs to be formatted once. The system disk contains several useful utilities. These utilities help you to format blank disks, to make backup copies of disks, and to perform many other disk-related tasks. What do you think of your Apple II computer now? I really like this computer now that I know how to use it. Yeah, Professor, you've taught us a lot. I can't wait to tap some other applications. 
Thanks, Professor. You make learning easy. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you. You are good students. If you would like to learn more about some of the applications that you can run on your Apple computer, see my video professor lessons about AppleWorks, one of the most versatile and popular programs available for the Apple II line of computers. AppleWorks is actually three applications in one, a word processor, a database, and a spreadsheet. With the combined power of these three applications, you will be able to use your computer to accomplish almost any task. Also, see my video professor lessons about WordPerfect or the Apple. WordPerfect is one of the most powerful word processing programs that is currently available for the Apple II line of computers. You can use WordPerfect to prepare professional-looking letters, memos, and research papers. Among its many features, WordPerfect has all the power you need to check your spelling, generate footnotes, prepare tables of contents, and create indexes. Well, have fun for now. Experiment, and once you feel comfortable with the introductory concepts, Presented in this lesson, delve further into the as many powerful ways you can use your Apple II, Apple IIc, or Apple II GS computer. And remember, there's always more you can learn from me, your video professor, in this and many other lessons. Now on the screen, you're seeing more selections of my video professor series.